So, uh, recording started. Um, so I'm going to give a little talk talking about uh, some things related to like number theory and the Langlands program and all that good stuff. Uh, but straight up, I'm, I'm just going to tell you that uh, I'm going to be lying to you because uh, it's a it's a very uh, complicated uh, sort of thing. And uh, and so for the sake of exposition, I will be telling you a bunch of little lies. Um, and also some of the lies I'll be telling you is just because I don't perfectly understand the theory um, myself. Um, so before we get into it, it's not necessary that you need to have seen these other talks, but I'm just going to say something for the people that have been at the other grad talks first. Um, and then I'll let you know uh, when the like talk is actually beginning and uh, maybe even point out some beat changes um, where, you know, if your eyes start crossing because we're talking about like complicated stuff, I'll be like, okay, here's a new thing. Uh, you can stop falling asleep now. Um, okay, so, so in Ryan's uh, previous talk, he told us about these things, elliptic curves, which uh, they're, you know, on one hand, very fancy, but, uh, you know, over the rational numbers, you can just write them as, as some sort of a polynomial equation into variables. And over the real numbers, they just like uh, they, they just look like uh, one of these or or one of these things over here. Um, and then we did something uh, kind of strange uh, for each prime number. Um, of course, we can look at this equation modulo p and count the solutions. So we define these things a sub p to be p minus uh, the number of solutions mod p. And then we could extend that to being defined for any uh, integer by just saying, okay, well, you know, say you had a product of two primes in the indice here, you would just literally uh, multiply those two things together. Um, and then we define something called an L function, um, which uh, would just be the sum from one to infinity of a sub n over n uh, to the s. So by the way, a very famous example of, uh, of L functions is the, the famous Riemann zeta function, which is just this sum where all the a sub n are equal to one. Uh, and you can actually rewrite it in terms of this product over all the prime numbers. Uh, that's gonna be an important idea later. And uh, so, so part of the point uh, of, of his talk was to say that, uh, well, if we take these very, uh, if you take these, functions, just these complex functions. Uh, here, this h just means the imaginary part of the input is bigger than zero, which are uh, in some sense very periodic. Um, and and they, they shrink really quickly as, as you approach infinity. Um, well, then if you think, oh, periodic functions, we can do things like Fourier theory, um, um, which by the way, these are, these are called modular forms. And because we can do Fourier theory, that means that they have Fourier expansions. Um, and we defined another L function um, over here, which was just the sum um, over those uh, Fourier coefficients. And sort of the, the big reveal was this um, uh, theorem uh, of, of Andrew Wiles. Well, I should say first, uh, uh, before even uh, a Andrew Wiles' famous theorem, we knew that there was some recipe to, uh, if someone handed you one of these, um, one of these special functions, you could cook up one of these um, elliptic curves and you could do it in such a way that the L functions um, agreed with each other. Um, but sort of the, the, the main punchline was the result of Andrew Wiles that said, uh, essentially this process is surjective. So you take any complex elliptic curve um, you can find one of these nice functions um, that will that will map to this curve in such a way that the L functions line up. Um, and then in Dat's talk the week before, he started telling us about um, you know class field theory and and, and the Langlands program, um, and he said something about how uh, there's this connection between these these two worlds, one called automorphic and the other called Galois. And that actually the, the Galois world can, can be understood in, in terms of geometry. And it turns out that actually what Ryan told us, this result that Ryan told us is just a little shadow of this much more general theme. So, so these functions happen to be what are called automorphic and uh, this geometry Galois connection 
uh, happens to be realized by the elliptic um, um, curves. Okay, so um, that's it for, for the, the, the brief review of people who have been here uh, previously. Uh, now we're gonna move on to something uh, somewhat different. Okay, so we would like to understand, uh, you know, our goal ultimately with all of this sort of stuff is, is to understand uh, number theory. In particular, we want to know all the different ways that we can extend the field of rational numbers. Um, it turns out that we can uh, encode a lot of information, even say just about like prime numbers and like what, what happens when we look at uh, how prime numbers break down when we extend to larger fields. And uh, this thing called, called gal uh, q bar over q is called the absolute Galois group. And it somehow, it, it, it like contains all of the symmetries of these possible ways to extend this. And there's this philosophy um, in, in the subject of class field theory that uh, somehow the rational numbers themselves should already know how to do this. Like somehow it knows itself all the ways that it could be extended. Um, so we might hope that there's some relationship between these two things, right? Um, some sort of way to pass back and forth, uh, somehow get at the information hidden in the rational numbers. But, um, well, okay, so how do we normally, you know, communicate the idea of a relationship in mathematics? Normally some sort of function, right? Um, and, and in particular, we like functions that preserve some sort of structure. So we might hope that there's some sort of uh, meaningful group homomorphism between these things that might encompass this idea. Um, well, this is maybe asking a little bit too much. I mean, the, the rational numbers are very easy, well understood structure. It's commutative. Uh, meanwhile, this thing is like big and complicated and very not commutative. Um, so probably that's asking a little bit too much. Um, but at least um, we can make sense of very complicated groups um, by studying something called representations of those groups. Um, so a representation of, of an arbitrary group G um, is just a homomorphism from G into the n by n invertible complex matrices for some n. Okay, what's the point of that? Uh, well, the thing is, as, as Dat uh, uh, said last time, there's really only one thing we understand in mathematics, linear algebra. Like that's really about all we know how to do and, and everything that, that we call a hard problem is just something we've not yet reduced to linear algebra. So um, what we're doing with this big complicated group by, by having this homomorphism, we're essentially saying, oh, I'm gonna represent each element of my group by a matrix. Okay, we know what those are. And I'm going to represent the, the group operation by matrix multiplication. Good. We know what that is. Okay, great. Um, and uh, so <laughs> side note, this will come back around again. I know this looks very complicated, um, but there is a way for all of these representations that we can uh, attach an L function. Now this looks sort of different to our previous definitions, but if I scroll up here um, and you see the, the, the way that the, the product version of the Riemann zeta function. Uh, here we've got an, a one and a p to the negative s. I mean, here we have an identity matrix and a p to the minus s. There's other complicated mumbo jumbo going on here. Um, but uh, uh, at least you can believe uh, maybe by the, the similarity between these two things or some uh, meaningful way in which this is an L function attached to um, such a thing. And I wanted to say um, uh, you, previously at Ryan's talk, um, AC had been asking about um, if these things have functional equations um, and if that means anything. Uh, well, there's this uh, conjecture of, of Artin um, that turns out if you, in fact, if you take any sort of extension, you can play this game of, of defining an L function. And uh, he conjectured that if your representation is not just sending everything to the identity um, um, and it's irreducible, then that implies that your uh, L function um, is entire. So that means it can be extended uh, to a function over the entire complex plane. 
Um, and, and this is a wide open uh, conjecture. We know it in, I think, dimension one, and I don't think we know it in, in absolutely in any other um, dimensions. So that's kind of interesting, right? There's like this, this connection between uh, some sort of uh, algebraic data and some sort of uh, analytic data, which is a, a common theme throughout all of this. Okay, well, representations, okay, we, so we've decided it's, uh, you know, we want to represent uh, the elements of our group, which, by the way, for the rest of the talk, G is just going to be um, this Galois group. And, well, where should we start? Well, probably the one-dimensional representations, right? Th that's going to be the easiest case to look at. Um, so those are just maps into GL1 of C. But I mean, that's just really the invertible complex numbers. So, so it's just a map uh, from G into the non-zero complex numbers. And what's nice about this is that our group, our, our very large group, really not abelian at all, right? The elements definitely don't commute in general. Um, but if we had a map into the complex numbers and we look at the composition of two elements, well, by the fact that it's a group homomorphism, I can split uh, this thing open. Um, but then now these are just a pair of complex numbers, right? So I can switch the order in which I'm multiplying those two things. Um, and again, it, uh, I can put it back together by the fact that it's a group homomorphism. So even though this group is really not um, abelian, the one-dimensional representations don't care because the target space is um, abelian. And so in fact, studying one-dimensional representations of this big complicated group is equivalent to studying representations on something called the abelianization of this group. Now, okay, that's some fancy, crazy technical mumbo jumbo, but it's basically like you take all the things that are uh, not abelian, you take all the sort of non-commutative stuff and you sort of just squish it down and like cut it out of your group. Um, and, and what's left is just sort of like the abelian piece of your group in some sense. Um, and, and so we've just sort of seen because these certain functions don't care about the elements that don't commute, um, it's really studying these sort of functions is equivalent to studying uh, these sort of functions. Um, okay, so, so we've taken this big ugly group uh, and uh, well, I shouldn't call it ugly. It is very pretty in many ways. Um, but but we've, we've figured out that at least in the one dimensional case, we can um, reduce its study just down to some, some maps of, of two abelian groups. Okay, so here's uh, the first beat change. So if anyone is like totally lost and like out in space and was like, what's going on? Now is the time to like wake up again and uh, try and absorb uh, the next new concept. Um, so we realize that uh, uh, so we've, we've talked about this side of, of the relationship we'd like to have. Let's talk about the side of the rational numbers. Well, um, uh, in order to say something about this, um, so, so the Galois group is about extending the rational numbers to a larger thing. Um, but we're now going to look at some sort of fields that are like internal to the rational numbers in some sense. So let me just remind you uh, the concept of a norm on a field says that, uh, so it's just, so uh, an example is just the absolute value on the real numbers, right? So it's something that uh, all the numbers are greater than or equal to zero. Uh, the norm is zero if and only if uh, it's, you have the additive identity of your field. Uh, it's multiplicative and it satisfies the triangle inequality. And so uh, this guy Ostrowski comes along and he proves this wacky theorem and he says, up to topological equivalence. Now, if you don't know what that means, don't worry about it. Um, for those of you uh, who do know some topology, it means that the topologies induced by the norm are homeomorphic, that's the equivalence, okay, whatever. There's some sort of way in which they all describe a shape, but up to some sort of notion of topological equivalence, there is only uh, this norm that we call uh, the absolute value sub infinity, and then for each prime number, there's exactly uh, one of these norms. And that's it. That's all the possible norms you could write down uh, on the field of rational numbers. 
Um, now, I'm not going to explain why, but there's a good reason we call this one sub-infinity, uh, but this is just the ordinary Euclidean norm. Uh, uh, this, this is just the normal absolute value on the rational numbers. The rest of these, uh, for each prime number, it's called the piadic norm. And all this, all this is, is uh, for every rational number, you write it in such a way that you factor out um, every power of P from the top and bottom and you gather it up. So this R could be uh, positive if, if you have more P's in the numerator than the denominator, and it could be negative if you have more P's in the denominator uh, than the numerator. And, and you simply define the piadic norm to be P to the minus R. Um, and so the way that this thing measures distance is kind of upside down from what we're used to. So we're used to um, you know, a rational number that has a lot of stuff on top, but not a lot of stuff in the bottom, we consider very big, right? But now we're saying if you have a lot of primes, uh, powers of P in the bottom, um, now you're very big. And if you have a lot of powers of P in the top, now you're very small. Um, and uh, uh, so there's another mysterious process um, called Cauchy sequence completion. And um, essentially what this does, so, so again, I, uh, I'll give you a concrete example in a second if, if, if you're not familiar with this, but um, essentially what this does is, is there's um, a, a nice way to build fields, uh, new fields that contain the rational numbers out of each one of these. And it turns out um, if you do this Cauchy sequence completion thing, with the regular Euclidean norm, uh, you just get the real numbers, which um, we can think of as just all the, uh, all the series that start at, um, uh, you know, we can, we, can make, um, we can take powers of 10 as small as we want, but they only go up to some finite uh, number um, with, with coefficients uh, between zero and nine. This is just writing numbers in, in base 10. But for each of the piadics, um, we flip it upside down. Remember, I just explained how the fraction sizes get flipped upside down. So we flip it upside down here. We say we're going to allow infinitely many large powers of P. But remember, those are things that we're saying are small now. Um, so we're going to let uh, infinitely large powers of P, but we're only going to go down to some finite uh, negative number. Um, and of course, uh, these are going to lie between 0 and P minus 1. So these are called the piadic numbers, and uh, these are the real numbers. And uh, just as a small little side quest, um, there's a really nice theorem, a, a, a sort of a practical application, if you will, called the uh, hasse minkowski theorem. And so what this says is, say you have a polynomial with rational number coefficients, which is quadratic. Um, so that means it's, it's basically, it's, it only has, each term has term at uh, degree at most two, but you could have any number of variables. Uh, then it turns out that this will have a solution um, in the, uh, uh, where you can take each of the, the xi to be rational numbers, um, if and only if it has a solution in q sub p for all p less than or equal to infinity. So, so for all the piadic numbers and the real numbers. So one direction of this is trivial, right? The, the, the rational numbers sit inside the real numbers and they sit inside all the piadic numbers. Um, but the other one is really interesting because um, you know, if we wanna solve this um, equation, well, if, if we can do it in the real numbers and the piadic numbers, uh, then you know, we're allowed to take like square roots and stuff. And there's some sort of process that allows us to take these and build it back up into a solution over the rational numbers. Um, now, uh, so, so let me just say something. Unfortunately, it doesn't hold more generally for general polynomial equations, say for um, an elliptic curve. This won't always be true, um, but it will sometimes be true. And that's actually a big field of study in elliptic curves and, and more generally Diophantine equations is like, when can we solve everything in piadic numbers and bring that back to a rational number solution? Um, okay, 
So we're in the we're in the home stretch here, gang. And my uh, uh, voice is starting to go, so that's good. Okay, so this Hassel-Minkowski theorem says that uh, uh, somehow studying all the p-adic numbers is useful, right? They all make some sort of meaningful contribution. Even if we're trying to solve some simple polynomial equation, like if we know something about each one of the p-adic numbers, including the real numbers, um, we could uh, uh, we can get interesting information about the rationals. So mathematicians have this bright idea. We're like, well, uh, why study them separately? Let's just study all of them at the same time. And so we literally just multiply them all together. And we call this object the Adels. Okay, I'm lying to you a little bit. There's this little tick mark here, um, which represents a, a, a small lie. I'm telling you, there, it, it's a little bit smaller than this. There's something we need to do to make sure we can still do like, calculus and, and Fourier theory and, and nice things with integrals on this. But, but basically we just sort of smush all these things together and we're like, wow, they're all important. Let's study them at the same time. And this is called the Adels. So um, the Adels, it's, it's gonna look like this sort of infinite uh, coordinate vector where we'll have a real number, a two attic number, a three attic number, so on, et cetera. Um, but then that means if you take any rational number um, and uh, again, we know the rational numbers are sitting inside of each of these fields. So if we take the coordinate that just has that same rational number in every single one of these, uh, we see that this, um, you know, gives us sort of what we call the diagonal embedding of the rational numbers into the Adels. Okay. And so finally, um, we come down to the statement of uh, the Langlands theorem or Langlands um, uh, conjecture. I guess it's a theorem in this case. And so what it says is that um, there is a bijection and the bijection takes you from characters of, of this object. So uh, the little x here means, um, I guess I should say the, the Adels are a ring, right? Just component wise, you can just add and multiply these things component wise. So um, AX is just the invertible elements of the Adels. QX is the invertible elements of, of the rational numbers. Um, and since you, they can be embedded diagonally in the Adels, we take this quotient. And so um, uh, the, the, the Langlands uh, uh, theorem in, in dimension one essentially says that there's a bijection that takes you from characters. So this is just one dimensional representations of this thing and uh, maps you over to characters of uh, one dimensional representations of, of this thing. So remember, this was the abelianization of our, um, of our uh, uh, Galois group, um, which, which was essentially equivalent to the study of, of one dimensional representations of, of, of the full uh, uh, Galois group. And, and furthermore, let me just, uh, before I even make this next statement, let me just um, um, remind you that we had something, some sort of bridge between um, automorphic world and elliptic curve world um, in such a way that the L functions agreed with each other. Um, then uh, over here, there's also a way um, to, to view these as, as telling you a value on each of the um, natural numbers. So there's a way to associate uh, an L function, um, um, basically, basically it just goes chi n over um, n to the s in such a way that just like before with this story about the elliptic curves, that the L function uh, the, the complicated L function we just uh, defined previously in terms of this product rule, um, that these things will agree if uh, this representation gets mapped to this representation. Okay, so this is essentially Langlands in dimension one or um, what, what people might call class field theory. And just to end off, I'm gonna say um, something about, well, where does one go from here? So, uh, uh, I mean, what we want to do is, is, is 
This is a relationship between one dimensional representations on this side and one dimensional representations on this side. And um, we were only able to study the abelianization because in one dimension, it, it lands in the complex numbers. This is abelian, right? As soon as you go to two by two matrices, these things don't commute anymore. So um, we should expect, uh, we should want some sort of map where now over here, we're gonna have to deal with the full Galois group um, and, and representations of it in dimension N. And uh, to figure out what happens on the left-hand side, well, um, notice that the saying, saying that we have the invertible um, elements of the Adels is like talking about the one, di one by one invertible matrices of Adels. Um, uh, and, and same thing, uh, talking about the invertible elements of the rational numbers is like talking about the uh, invertible one by one matrices. So in general, uh, the Langlands program conjectures that there's some way to relate uh, representations of, of this group. So GLN of, of uh, the Adels, GLN of, of Q, um, two representations uh, of the Galois group here. And the relationship here now becomes much more complicated, um, but the point is also um, not only should there be some way of mapping between these, but it should do it in such a way that uh, the L functions, you, there's a way to define L functions in this case, um, uh, such that they agree. And as just one final comment uh, to bring it back to um, uh, what Ryan was talking about, um, it turns out that the, the, the representations that you look at all appear as uh, certain sub-representations of L2 functions. So I apologize if, I, if I'm getting too far out for uh, some people right now, but um, uh, L2 functions are basically just like functions you can do Fourier theory on. And remember all the way back at the talk, uh, at the top of the talk, um, what was Ryan telling us before? Oh yeah, these functions had some sort of Fourier expansion and we were relating uh, these functions with Fourier expansion um, over, over here. Yeah, that's it. That's all. Um, I guess I will open it up to questions now. If you have questions here, you can tell us that it's here. Do you have any questions? Are you also just talking about? You said that uh, real numbers or, or real numbers lie inside all periodic numbers. What exactly do you mean by that? Uh, sorry, can you can you repeat that? You said that all the real numbers, right? But lie in when you were uh, showing the Minkowski Haas theorem. Yeah. Right. You said how one direction is trivial because rationals lie inside the reals, lie inside all the periodics. Yes. What exactly do you mean by reals lie inside all the periodics? Ah, ah, okay. So, so this this has to do with the the thing um, I didn't say um, uh, just just to save save on time. So, um, uh, uh, so let me explain it two ways. So, first, let's go back and look at our our, our description here. Um, so, certainly, you probably believe all the the rational numbers are con uh, contained inside of the reals. Right, um, that that much should be clear. Um, the the same thing is true over here uh, uh, with the the piatic numbers. Um, so so certainly, I mean, if if you think about like expansions of of rational numbers in say base ten, or uh, you know, uh, compare it to expansions in base p, let's say, um, we know that rational numbers either have a finite decimal expansion. Um, or one that repeats. And so certainly um, uh, uh, the, the same thing is going to be true of the, of the finite decimal expansion um, over here. That's maybe not so clear. So, so, so let, me, um, um, let, let me put it another way. Um, um, the sort of real way that, that, that you define these things is um, um, if you have, uh, so, so say you've got your uh, rational numbers 
you've got your norm. P could be infinity or one of the prime numbers. Um, we create a new space, QP, and uh, the elements of the space um, are, are going to be uh, Cauchy sequences. So, so uh, Cauchy sequences of, of rational numbers. So these are just sequences of, of rational numbers, which like uh, get closer and closer, their terms get closer and closer together. And you might think this is the same thing as a convergent sequence, um, but the problem is like you can have rational, you can have a sequence of rational numbers that say converge to the square root of two or something. And the square root of two is it, itself not rational. So what we do is we say, okay, I'm, I'm now going to make a new space where every number is represented by a Cauchy sequence that, that converges to that number. So, so our space is literally um, Cauchy sequences of, of the rational numbers. Um, and then we mod out by, by the sequences uh, that converge to zero. Okay, this is some sort of technical process, but, but in other words, it's like, um, you have the rational numbers, you, have the, you know what sits inside the real numbers. So there's somehow little gaps. You need to fill something in. And, and when you create the real numbers from the rationals, you just say, okay, we're gonna fill in all the little holes, right? And so the creation of the p-adic numbers for, P, for, for other p, it's the same thing. You're gonna say, okay, we, we, um, I have some sequences that like converge, but not to a rational number. So I'm just gonna plug in all those holes, but I'm doing it with respect to a different form of measurement. I'm, I'm no longer measuring the typical absolute value. I'm now measuring how many times can I divide this number by uh, the prime p. Sorry, I had a comment about this. Mm -hmm. The real numbers are formally different from p-adic numbers. So for instance, square root two as a real number is different from square root two in a triadic space, for right. instance. Right. So as a real number, square root two is not in any of the p-adics. Right. Yeah. Yes, yes. So the reason we like the, was it like the, what was that A again? What, what was the name oh, for that? Oh, the, the Adele's? The Adele's. Okay, that's what I thought it was, but then I, yeah. I, I thought in my head I just got to put stuff with the singer, but it, it actually is the Adele's. Right, um, right. That, that was part of the, my, my joke in the, in the abstract. <laughs> okay. Yeah, this is the Adele's. Yeah. Um, so the reason we like to use those here is because it holds all the information for each of the, the p-addicts, and then we can try to relate that to regular Q. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, so so that's kind of my justification for this talk. There's, I mean, other ways that 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 you could um, argue about how we were led to to studying the the object of Adele's. Um, yeah, so for me, I I just like this this um, perspective where like because of, I mean, a variety of different things, right? Because like Ostrowski's theorem uh, tells us that these are the only absolute values um, uh, up to some sort of equivalence on the rational numbers. And we have things like Hassan Minkowski that says, um, well, if you know information about every single one of the p-adic numbers um, at once, that, that gives you back information about the rational numbers. Um, and so, and so the, to me personally, these, these two theorems um, really justify uh, studying all of these objects at the same time. And then, I mean, what, what would that mean? Like, how do you study all of these objects at the same time? Uh, well, I don't know, you take a product or something, right? Because like, if you just took a union, that's not really clear how you actually still have some sort of like ring structure out of it, um, but a product makes sense. Um, and then there's, uh, there's also this tick thrown in there though. Um, you have to do something to uh, make sure the product's not too big. That just still allows you to do like integration and stuff. Is that like making sure you're only like, like only a finite amount of them are um, not zero or? 
Yeah, uh, yeah, almost, almost. So, so um, each of each of the the, the piadic numbers for, for p not equal to infinity, they contain something called uh, uh, the piadic integers, and um, just sort of like. I mean, if, uh, for the real numbers, the, the integers are the ones where you don't take any negative powers of, of 10. Uh, same thing with the piatic numbers. It, but but uh, here it's, um, uh, sorry, it's on, right. So it's you're on, only working on with side. negative powers of P. Yeah. OK. Yeah. And it, actually, it turns out there's a lot of other interesting uh, similarities between the piatic integers and, and the integers and like how they work as rings and everything. Um, but it turns out that that these things are are compact in the topological sense. And so what you demand is that all but finitely many belong to these compact um, uh, 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 pieces. And that ensures that that your Adele's are something which is called uh, locally compact. Um, and and that is the property that we need to have um, uh, really nice uh, to, to do like, integration. And, yeah, that makes sense if they're local. That, that, that seems like it would help a lot. Yeah, yeah. Cool, thanks. Do a question that? Yeah. Um, can you scroll down to the, the part where you stated on the last word in the other one? Right. Um, isn't there a term missing there? Sorry? Isn't there a term missing there? I, I thought that if, if you were to state it like this, shouldn't that only be a suggestion? Um, because there should be a, a ring of integer q, right? Or is it different for number fields? So um, here's here's one of the lies that I've told because I'm not an expert. Um, but I think it's actually by ejection uh, because in in this particular case, um, you actually have a a group isomorphism between this and this. Yeah, yeah, that's my question. I, I thought that it would only be a group, like a subjective group of homomorphism, and then the kernel would be the units of the ring of integers of Q. Um, I think I think maybe so. I could be wrong, but I think like if you're taking like number fields, you're taking extensions of Q, then that's maybe where you have to put some sort of a uh, kernel here or something on this side. Right. Um, but I'm not, uh, I'm not entirely sure. I know that at least for function fields, you need a, a third term, but I don't know. I don't understand Q too well. Um, yeah, I don't, I, I don't know so much about the, the function fields case. Okay. Um, I think Edel class characters do correspond um, bijectively to the one dimensional representation of the abelianization, but if you go in higher dimensions, you have to go modulo, like a compact, like a maximal compact. Right. Something like that. Right. Uh, but an Edel class characters are like tensors of characters such that almost all of them are trivial on some kind of maximal compact anyway. So that might be the extra term that Dot is talking about. Yeah, that, that, that might be. Okay, thanks. Yeah. I have, a, I have a question. Yeah. So, do you know how much work has been done for like dimension two? Like, do you think we're like close to getting like the results or? Yeah. Um, I mean, all I know about dimension two is that, uh, so, so actually, for example, um, uh, we do more general things than talk about the groups GLN of A. Um, we, we actually talk about much more general groups that, that can be valued in the Adels. Um, the only thing I know about dimension two is I I exactly what you talked about um, the other week, which is um, uh, uh, the, the, the modularity theorem that, that Andrew Wiles proved. So... We know in like the very special case of like you have an elliptic curve or um, more, um, more, pre more precisely what, what Andrew Wiles actually proved was, was a statement um, on, on this level. And then, uh, but the more accessible version uh, that, that was stated uh, say in Ryan's talk is actually uh, what that connection looks like if you go over to uh, uh, geometry world. Um, but 
in any case, the extent of what I know here in dimension two is just, yeah, the modularity theorem, which says like, you have an elliptic curve. Um, I think it's, it's pretty general now, right? You have an elliptic curve and then there exists. I mean, there's a lot more modifiers that, that, that haven't been talked about here. It's gotta be like a cusp form of weight two and the you know modularity of the conductor and the, some sort of character, blah, blah, blah. A, a lot more complicated uh, information going on here um, than, than I initially let on. Um, but that's about the state of it, I, I, I know. Um, I, I work in, in what's called the local Langlands program, um, which basically says, um, okay, you know, we, we know that these Adele's are, um, this Adelic stuff is, is great, but like, what if we went back down uh, to the level of just uh, QP and we studied some sort of uh, a relationship here, like between like these representations um, and then found some relationship between these groups of like, you know, dimension N and, and studied something about those representations. Yeah. The type of the um, I can hear that talking, but I can't hear um, what's being said. <clears throat> I was saying that the modularity theorem is known for CM fields and quadratic extensions. Um, Sorry, I'm still having a, a hard time uh, hearing you. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I was saying that the modularity theorem holds also for quadratic extensions and CM fields over Q. Um, right. Yeah. I mean, the, there's other ways to generalize it too, like like instead of uh, uh, starting with uh, just number fields, like. There's other kinds of fields. So, so this is only a small fraction of, of like the whole Langlands uh, perspective, right? There's like global Langlands, which is like this Adele thing. And then like, you can make that more general with number fields. And then there's like local Langlands where you like break that open and look at the individual pieces. And then there's like geometric Langlands. And I think that's the function field perspective. And there's like all this whole like zoo of, of versions of this uh, common theme, yeah. Yeah, and I have no idea the the state of uh, um, all of these fields. We actually know a lot more uh, for function fields, which is what I tried to say last right. time. We right. know we know the at least the geometric like, you know, the, the toy version of this vector for all GLNs, not just GL one or GL two, but all of them. Um, and this has been done since 1999, 2000. Okay. But we only know the geometric version. We have no idea how to descend it down to like a, like a group theoretic statement. Right, right. Aside from for dimension one, that is. Right. Yeah, let me, let me know if you, uh, uh, anyone who might have uh, uh, appeared on Zoom with their questions or anything. Uh, uh, let me know if you absolutely don't want this video uploaded to YouTube. Otherwise, uh, there will be a version. Yeah. Thanks again.